All right, good evening, y'all, and welcome to the Berkeley Forum. Uh, my name is Charlie, and as Vice President of Events at the Berkeley Forum, I'm extremely honored and grateful to be introducing our speaker for the night, Alexander Waterbury. Uh, but before we begin, out of respect to the speaker, please silence your phones and put away any devices. Ms. Waterbury is a current undergraduate at Columbia University, a fashion model, and a ballerina. She trained at the School of American Ballet, danced professionally for Ballet Next, and now dances with the Columbia Ballet Collective. She has modeled for brands including Tommy Hilfiger, Mac Cosmetics, Arthur Elgort, Arthur Elgort, and Alan von Unwer. In 2018, she came forward against the New York City Ballet and several of its employees for sexual assault. Since then, she has decided to declare a double major in political science and women's studies at Columbia. With the larger goal of changing the culture of sexual assault in the workplace and in society at large, she has joined the founding team at Schiff & Company, a fine jewelry startup that donates 50% of its profits to female entrepreneurs. She hopes to change the statistic of female entrepreneurs who receive venture capital in order to create more female CEOs. Her list of accomplishments are endless, but without further ado, please join me in welcoming Alexander Waterbury to the stage. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alex Waterbury and I'm so excited to be here tonight. As you know, I'll be discussing sexual assault and harassment in the dance world and society at large in reference to my personal experience with the New York City Ballet this past year. First and foremost, I'd like to extend my gratitude to Berkeley for hosting the Berkeley Forum and for creating the space to continue conversations surrounding topics like this. I fear that the conversation surrounding sexual assault and harassment in the media has been cut far too short, far too soon. In order for our society to grow and change, we must discuss these problems, their roots for emergence, and the foundations that keep them in place. Tonight, I hope to further this conversation by examining how assault happened to me. I want to explore the environment in which it was created, the societal pressures and expectations that cause the actors to behave in such ways, and how these actions are perpetuated from generation to generation. I'd also like to thank Ankita for all of her due diligence in planning this talk and for all the details that went into it. Bearing with me, my schedule, and the time difference between California and New York. You are a wonder woman personified. <laughs> I'll be speaking about some key actors in my lawsuit tonight my ex-boyfriend and former principal dancer of the New York City Ballet, Chase Finley, his friend and former co-worker, Zach Cavazzaro, former principal dancer of the New York City Ballet, and their other friend and former co-worker, Amar Ramasar. Chase stepped down from his position at the company a few days before the lawsuit was filed, and Amar and Zach were put on suspension. After further being fired, Zach and Amar were reinstated after a union arbitration took place which had taken none of the evidence from my lawsuit or from my assault and many other women's assault into consideration. Zach chose to remain dancing in Europe instead of returning to City Ballet, whereas Amar had no shame and resumed his position there. These men, along with many others, received and circulated images and videos of me and Chase in our intimate moments. I had no knowledge of the images or videos and certainly did not consent to their dissemination. This is what sexual assault of the 21st century looks like, and it happens more often than we know. These men would have been criminally charged if a law had been instated two months prior to when some of these photos were taken and circulated. Unfortunately, law will not and cannot keep up with technology, so oftentimes people are underprotected in this respect. Instead of focusing on what women are subjected to in society, tonight I'd like to do the inverse to see what men are subjected to and if it could have somehow contributed to my assault. Oftentimes victims are left wondering, what did I do wrong? And wondering, why did this happen to me? I know I did nothing to deserve this and there is nothing that can justify what these men did. But I've spent a lot of time asking myself, how did this happen? So for those of you that don't know, even though you guys mentioned it in the intro, I'm a current junior at Columbia University. I'm studying political science and women's studies, but was fortunate enough to be in a sociology class where I came across Christine Williams' study titled The Glass Escalator. The hidden advantages 
for men in female professions. This sociological study put my curiosity at bay as to how this situation between Chase Finley, his co-workers, the New York City Ballet, and myself happened, or at least gave me clarity on the matter. Williams examines men's underrepresentation in four predominantly female occupations, nursing, librarianship, elementary school teaching, and social work. Throughout the 20th century, these occupations were identified as women's work, similarly to ballet. It is thought that mostly women do these jobs, whereas other fields of work, such as stock trading, construction, and engineering, are reserved for men only, which is one of the factors that creates the glass ceiling that women are often subjected to and try to break through when entering these fields. Williams' interview data suggests that men do not face discrimination when entering female-dominated occupations, unlike women in male-dominated occupations. However, men do encounter prejudice from individuals outside of their professions. With this framework, I'd like to examine the ballet world's internal environment and external envi environment, sort of like beginning with the micro and expanding outward to the macro. We'll find the roots of emergence to these problems in the dance world itself and outside, or, and in the outside world's opinions of the dance world. Beginning with the internal, it seems as though ballet starts as classes full of little girls and occasionally a boy or two. By the time I got to boarding school for ballet around the beginning of high school, I was in ninth grade, I was 13, um, there were more males in class to the point where they had their own class to practice male technique, which often includes different jumps, an emphasis on turning, and no point work. Men did not seem to face discrimination inside of the dance world. Actually, in my experience, they were treated with complete respect from institutions, oftentimes being put on a pedestal. Whether this was coming from an attempt to make males feel welcome in class and in the environment, or purely sexist, I'm not sure. Male students often received full scholarship to programs, and it seemed as though male students got preferential treatment from teachers and <coughs> staff. Williams points to this idea when interviewing men in teaching positions and the relationships they build with other men in their industry. One teacher said, occasionally I've had a principal who would regard me as the other man on campus and said, it's us against them, you know? Similarly, similarly inside the dance world, Chase Finley and his co-workers, the boys, had to stick together. Men inside of the dance world bond over their rarity and never viewed their rarity as an issue, whereas oftentimes females breaking into a male-dominated industry rarely confide in other women. The environments tend to be more competitive in an effort to keep up with or surpass the men that they work with. Williams says women were more likely to attempt blending in rather than standing out in male-dominated industries such as the military. Men in non-traditional female occupations deal with their gender and sex as a positive difference. Therefore, they have an incentive to emphasize their distinctiveness from the female majority. This effort was found in Chase and his co-workers' conversations about me and the women that they worked with. These men chose to diminish women in order to establish their difference. Close personal ties with male supervisors and superiors were also described by men in William, William's study. In regards to men in higher positions, it is a known fact in the dance world that a majority of directors and choreographers are men. Dance Magazine noted in July of 2019 that 81% of ballets are be that are being performed are choreographed by men. In this situation, I believe, Chase Finley, Amar Ramasar, and Zach Cabazzaro were led by a horrible example, Peter Martins. Martins was the director of the New York City Ballet for decades. He chose all of these men personally and chose Chase privately for his role of Apollo, which was similarly performed by Catazzaro and Martins himself. Martins was a man who abused his wife and was picked up from jail by a New York City Ballet board member who is currently still on the board. Martins could get away with anything. Why couldn't the men that worked for him, who were following in his footsteps, do the same? Chase had quite literally been told after flooding a hotel room in Washington, D.C. on tour with the New York City Ballet that he could do whatever he pleased in New York because it could be better controlled but to behave on tour. He was on a pedestal that was much too high. Female students rarely had anything against male students either. If anything, female students wanted to be on a male student's good side 
So when it came time for partnering class, a girl could have the best partner in the class and do better than all other students. Acceptance of male students among faculty and fellow students was often very high with low stigma. Chase Finley was known for being the popular boy, the talented and good looking heterosexual dancer. Chase Finley very much benefited from his sex and gender performance within the dance world while having additional special treatment from the director of the New York City Ballet. His pedestal reached its height around the age of 23 when he was promoted to principal, the highest rank in the company. Chase rode what Williams describes as the glass escalator, where women often have trouble breaking through the glass ceiling in male-dominated industries. Williams found men were actually lifted up by their rarity in female-dominated industries, especially when the superiors were of the same sex, male. Williams' framework fits perfectly to Chase and Martin's relationship. I'm sure you could find the same with the now director, John Stafford. To expand to the macro or the larger picture, picture, let's move to the perception of the dance world from the outside. Williams discusses how women in women's fields are often championed for their work, saying things along the lines of, you have a baby and teach kindergarten? How amazing. Whereas female dancers are championed in the same way. The mere fact that women are working is praised, which makes sense after our long historical struggle to enter the workplace. But perceptions and opinions from outside of the dance world about men in the dance world seem to differ. There is little praise. As we recently saw on Good Morning America and then on Fox News, men were subjected to ridicule for doing ballet as an occupation or even a hobby. What constitutes a manly man is obviously deeply rooted in our Western society. Many of us hold our own assumptions of gender and stereotypes and can perpetuate these misconceptions in the same way Laura Spencer did on Good Morning America. Laura Spencer was ignorant in her comments about how Prince George would eventually decide he wouldn't like ballet, insinuating that it was a ridiculous thing for males to do. The stereotypes surrounding males in the dance world are often negative, including that one must be a homosexual if they pursue dance as a career. Oftentimes, there are jokes about the tights that they wear and their overall masculinity. William says, stigma associated with homosexuality leads some men to enhance or even exaggerate their masculine qualities and may be another factor pushing men into more acceptable industries. Toxic masculinity is created in this way and has very real consequences. Chase Finley and Amar Ramazar exemplify this exact idea in the New York City Ballet's web series when asked about being bullied while growing up and doing ballet. Finley and Ramasar are sitting side by side as they boast of how they defy these negative stereotypes because they got to spend the day lifting women while other male athletes spend their days wrestling other men. There was almost a homophobic connotation to their comments and laughs. Here, they were asserting that they were not the homosexuals the world assumed them to be, and they used women as the example to prove it. Williams blames this outsider perspective when saying, this particular form of discrimination may be the most significant in explaining why men are underrepresented, underrepresented in these professions. Men who otherwise might show interest in or aptitude for such careers are probably discouraged from pursuing them because of the negative popular stereotypes associated with the men who were in them. Even when my brother and I were put into figure skating, the hockey coach at the rink would make comments about he should be on the team, not figure skating. My brother eventually quit altogether. Hopefully Prince George pursues whatever passion he chooses, regardless of social stigma. In the othering of women, through men sticking together and the mentality of it's us against them, Chase and his friends created these group chats where they would boast of their maleness, their difference, and their higher stature which they had gained from work. The women they talked about were equivalent to farm animals, and I was nothing more than an object to be shared via photo and video. All the while, they were Apollo, the Greek god on the pedestal that could joke about rape and abuse. The harm done to me and others was carried out by these men, but was predicated on society having these deeply rooted beliefs about what men are really supposed to be like. In an attempt to assure their fellow male colleagues of their masculinity and straightness, harm had to be done to women. They had to prove their power over us. 
As a society, we have these generalizations in regards to many industries and environments. In William's study, she discusses how parents were afraid of male kindergarten teachers because they may have been pedophiles for wanting to work with kids. Male librarians were described as asexual and not masculine. Social workers were described as passive and feminine, all for merely having specific jobs. After reading this article, it was clear, okay, society has all of these expectations and stereotypes which are imposed on not only women, but obviously men as well. So now what? How does society shake loose their firmly held beliefs of gender stereotypes? When does society stop ridiculing people for their sexuality, gender identity, and gender expressions? When do we stop assuming traits of people based on their professions and hobbies? When do we start raising our children without such strict binaries of gender? When can we start appreciating people for being people? Laura Spencer is presumably forward-thinking, educated, and for the most part, PC. If she can make this claim so effortlessly, what do we expect from the rest of society? I would like to see people of all sexual orientations, genders, and gender expressions living their lives to the fullest by pursuing their passions. I would hope to see acceptance among colleagues inside their respective fields and acceptance from people outside of their fields. Changes in law and culture will only further the progress of our people. Hopefully in asserting oneself and their identity, there will not be harm done to their other, but rather appreciation for difference and acceptance of the skills those individuals offer to society. Oftentimes, social movements revolve around this self-assertion for recognition and accurate acknowledgement of marginalized groups of people. However, in the specific case of my lawsuit, the othering of women should not and will not suffice in asserting one's social standing. These men should not have found their identity and stature predicated on women and their inferiority. Their masculinity should not have been based off of women's femininity, submissiveness, or belittlement. The binaries of masculine to feminine, girl to boy, or man to woman are dangerous and clearly can be taken much too far. To the institutions that harmfully perpetuate these binaries and stereotypes, yes, the dance world, and all of the companies and school inside of it, I am speaking to you. This can no longer stand. To all individuals, Question your own assumptions of gender and gender roles, or run the risk of encountering the ridicule Laura Spencer faced. In 2019, women are no longer your other. In 2019, those in the LGBTQ community are not your inferior. In 2019, we are equal and we demand respect. Thank you. Like, 
I think a lot of the women in this lawsuit that also didn't come forward, didn't come forward because they were at the grips of their bosses. I wasn't. Um, so I think realistically the dance world needs some sort of outside entity where people can report and know that something will be done about it because I know for a fact that there have been people who have reported harassment, sexual harassment to HR at City Ballet. This one photographer got fired and then randomly gets reinstated after a dancer gets paid off to leave. Like, there needs to be something more for dancers. There's, yeah, I don't know. Even at like school, there's student governments where you kind of have a voice. And at companies or at these ballet schools, you are replaceable. You are just another student. You are just another dancer. There's no outlet for when harm is done. And so, I don't know, somebody needs to create something. That's what I would hope to see in the dance world. You mentioned the company's role specifically in rehiring people that are guilty of kind of contributing to that culture of sexual harassment. After the New York City Ballet fired Amar Ramasar and Zachary Kazaro in relation to your case, they were both offered their previous jobs back after several months of mediation. What, if at all, do you see as the broader social implications of this decision on the company and the industry as a whole? Um, I think what it said blatantly was we don't care what happened to you, that it wasn't an issue. And I think like, I don't know, I'm told not to comment on their hiring. Um, It was just, it was done in a way that was, it took nothing into consideration as to what happened. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so you also touched on your transition from the world of dance to the world of modeling. And some have argued that female models face similar issues to those of female ballet dancers. As you made that career switch, how do you think your experience in ballet has informed how you go about your modeling careers? Um, Every time I go to a photo shoot, I actually like let people know right at the beginning of the shoot, like I am studying political science. I would love to have a career in politics one day. I can't have scandalous photos going around, whatever. So I put that right on the table at the very beginning so I know, so I can set an expectation. And then also, um, yeah, I don't know, I kind of, you develop this like attitude and I think it's it's easily perceived by everybody else on set, like, don't screw with me. Like, you, you have to have that or else people will be like, oh, you're innocent and you're, you can easily be taken advantage of and I'm just like, no. no. Um, so, um, you've previously expressed a desire to warn young dancers of the dangers that they may face from the toxic culture within the industry. How, if at all, do you think your relationship with dance has changed since re-entering ballet at Columbia? Um, I don't take it as seriously anymore. Um, wait, sorry, how does so children... Oh, so um, so you face that desire to kind of warn children that are entering ballet as young dancers mm -hmm. um, to kind of warn them from that toxic culture. Yeah. And since you were uh, you were kind of a victim of that culture, how do you think your relationship with dance has changed since re-entering ballet? Yeah, I just I don't take it as seriously. It's no longer a competition or an attempt to doing it as a job, like you have to audition to do it as a job. So I feel like a lot of the time, kids growing up kind of enter that bubble thinking like their life is dependent upon how well they do, and yeah, it's not. You can do other things, and there's a world outside of dance. 
And so what do you think needs to be done to make the world of female-dominated activities such as ballet or gymnastics safer for young girls? I think outside entities, because even in the case of um, the gymnastics team, they were all reporting to like whatever those organizations are that run US gymnastics. Like it's all very internalized and there is no like procedure that protects people, especially kids. So in terms of the way that you've gotten in touch with your audience in terms of sharing your experiences, um, you moved the conversation surrounding sexual harassment and your experience to social media platforms. Um, so after sharing these experiences, after several months of having to conceal it from your fairly substantial following, what were the challenges that you faced in navigating that transition? From being quiet about things to living very open? Yeah. Uh, so my lawyers are uh, very active, um, constantly reminding me that I can't post certain things, like images that would make me look a certain way because I, our society still thinks, oh, well, she's in a bikini on Instagram, so she was asking for it. No. But in any regard, like, they're like, you have to be careful of what you post, what you say. Um, like right now, I'm actually not allowed to do any interviews. Um, but this is like plan way in advance. But so like everything that I say or post, <coughs> my self-representation is restricted still, even though it's public. And so how do you think social media can be used as a tool to kind of help others like empathize with your situation or maybe feel better about something that they've been through? Okay, social media has actually been really amazing throughout this. Um, so many people have reached out telling me of their own experiences and like it makes me amazed first of all at how many people actually go through this. Like I'm so surprised that it's not talked about more. Like literally so many people go through it. Um, but also, I don't know, I think in doing it, a lot of, like, in coming forward, a lot of people have thanked me, saying, like, you helped me resolve this thing with myself, or my abuser, or whatever. Um, it's kind of like really humbling. Like, I'm like, oh, I just did this because it was really wrong, like, what happened to me. But um, it means a lot to people, so being able to connect with people over social media has been really kind of cool. And the violation of privacy that you specifically experienced happened in the context of a serious two-year relationship. So what conversations, if any, do you think that your story can create around the idea of consent in long-term relationships? I don't even know. Obviously, it was a matter of consent, because I never consented to any of this, or even knew that it was going on. But also, what I think was such a big problem with that relationship, and I would love to speak about it more, um, is like what a toxic relationship looks like. At the time, entering it, I was, I had just turned 19, and he was 27. Um, it was like my very first real relationship where like we had apartments and jobs and obligations and like <coughs> my parents weren't around to see how I was doing every day. I really didn't know what I was falling into and I, I, I think Columbia actually helped me get out of it as well like it was just a really bad situation and I think so many young girls would look at someone like Chase Finley and be like oh my god I want to date him and then when he finally starts asking you out you're like oh my god he's asking me out and then it's like you just completely lose yourself so I don't know I think conversations about what healthy relationships are and uh, what you should tolerate in a relationship. And you spoke about how Columbia was actually helpful for you in healing throughout this process. So what do you think might be the role of education in the healing process in terms of people learning more about um, situations like the one that you went through? 
Well, like, this entire speech was even based off of, like, an article that I read at Columbia. And I don't know if it's just me, and it's like an analytical kind of understanding of these situations rather than emotional. But I think education is, like, obviously you can be educated about sexual respect, you can be educated about healthy relationships, you can be educated about inequalities in the workplace and in society and in your everyday lives. I think it just opens your eyes to everything that you actually experience, but you might not be aware that you're experiencing it. And so um, having these incredible professors that I have being like, these things are real and this might be happening to you or to your friends, you're like, oh, okay. And you start to see it in your everyday life. So I don't know. I don't know if it's the end of and in terms of that transition to education at Columbia, in the height of your dance career at the School of American Ballet, you spent up to 36 hours a week training at the Lincoln Center. How, if at all, has the discipline you gained from your dance career impacted your current work? I think it's helpful, honestly. I think um, <coughs> we were held to like such a high standard at such a young age um, that everything else almost seems simple. Uh, I mean, not that Columbia is simple, it's very hard. It's a lot of hours in the library and uh, a lot of sacrifices in your social life. But um, yeah, I, I think that discipline is applicable to all areas of your life. And another factor of having such heavy involvement with your ballet school was the amount of time that you spent with your fellow dancers. What, if any, were the challenges of filing a very public lawsuit amongst people that you've known for so long and know so well? I lost basically all of my friends that I went to SAB with. Um, I don't go to the ballet anymore. Uh, I don't know, every time I see somebody at school, because I mean, like, Columbia gets these discounted tickets to the ballet, whatever, some people go and they post it on their story or they buy a t-shirt and they wear a t-shirt. I literally am like, oh my god, take the t-shirt off, don't wear it at school. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's been weird in the dance world. I, A lot of people at different companies have reached out being like, thank you for what you did, but people in New York, I feel like, have completely disappeared out of my life. So, but I mean, it's probably the best. And so, um, another kind of uh, toxic element of the culture that you said the company perpetuated was that of heteronormativity. So, um, what do you think that um, the kind of view of Chase Findlay as someone who should be placed on a pedestal for having that sexuality speaks to about the broader conversation of heteronormativity? Or why do you think that that's an issue within the industry of ballet? Um, I think it's an issue because it's like so blatantly obvious, and I don't think gender is a binary. Gender is very much on a spectrum. It's a performance. I think just continuing those like very outdated ideas of gender can be extremely harmful. And in dance, it's always a male and a female partnering together. And it's always a male choreographer talking down to a female dancer. It's always a male director deciding what that woman can do with her life. I mean, oftentimes, not so much recently, but like having a child even in your personal life was like an issue and taboo. And nobody did that because that conflicted with your job. Like, I don't know, I just, I think, it's time for it to change. And I mean, like, the dance world, they say they're attempting to by having, like, girls partner girls and boys partner boys. And, like, yes, that's an effort, but also, like, is there any trans representation? Is there a racial representation? Like, it's not actually as forward as I think they try and advertise it to be. Like, they're not as progressive as they could be. <coughs> um, so in that respect, I think it's just very outdated. It's a change. For the sake of time, this is going to be my last question before moving on to questions from the audience. 
Your work at the jewelry company Chiffon hopes to change the statistic of female entrepreneurs who receive venture capital in order to create more female CEOs. What, if at all, do you see as the possible impact of this shift on changing attitudes towards sexual assault in the workplace and on society as a well? whole? Well, so if the females are the CEOs, you don't have Peter Martins doing what Peter Martins did. I don't know. I mean, obviously, anybody can, if given power, can abuse that power. But um, statistically, women have never even had the chance to have that power. So um, I think it's time to give women a shot. Yeah. Thank, you. Much. Thank you so much for answering our questions. We're now going to move on to audience questions. If you have something that you'd like to ask Ms. Waterbury, please raise your hand and I'll call on you. And please try to keep your questions brief and remember to speak up. Any tickets? Yeah, go ahead. I like the part she lost in her voice, so like, excuse my voice. But, um, so, have you ever thought about like, once you graduate, going back into the ballet world? Definitely not in New York City Ballet, but like another ballet company. Have you ever thought about that? I'm just wondering. Um, I don't know. I mean, I have friends that dance in Europe, and from what I see on Instagram, it looks like magical. Like, <laughs> it looks really amazing. Um, that would be incredible, but also I I feel like I've spent so much time working towards like getting a degree and towards like this whole other path that I don't necessarily think I would go back. I mean, like I said, it seems very magical and whatever, but um, I think whether it's like activism or like going to law school and trying to like change circumstances for people, I think that's more important, to me at least. No, probably not. Yeah, go ahead. Have you thought about law school? I have. Um, so two of my aunts are lawyers, and my brother's in his third year of law school. Um, so I figured if my brother could do it, I could definitely do it. <laughs> um, and I actually, I'm in a law class right now, which is taught by um, a professor at Columbia Law. And she's brilliant, and I love the class, and I write case briefs every week. So that's it's like a little taste of law, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, anyone else audience questions? Uh, go ahead. You talked about the potential for an outside organization that ballerinas could reach out to without fear of punishment <coughs> from internal organizations. Mm -hmm. um, can you think of someone better to start such an organization than yourself? Well, <laughs> I, have, I think, uh, I mean, I think people could argue that AGMA exists, which kind of is the representation for all artists, like it's, it's for Broadway people, like SAG people, all of that. Um, but I mean, obviously they did not do their due diligence. So. Um, I don't know. Obviously I think it's important in the dance world to have that, but also I want to spend my time probably working on other issues in society. I mean, obviously, like, issues like this, but I don't know, I, I kind of, I don't know if I have much hope for the dance world. Um, so I don't know. I, yeah, I have no idea. The person who started the thing called Model Alliance actually is also a Columbia alum, and she's incredible. She was a keynote speaker this past spring. So, I mean, maybe like Sarah, what in, how did you do this? But I don't know. I don't know if that would be fun. And then you'll be another question. Yeah, um, you mentioned that uh, you were able to go through with your lawsuit because you uh, worked in the cut as many of the lawsuits, I guess. Mm -hmm. Do you think that your peers at SAP were able to so easily eliminate you after your lawsuit? Like after that, or, or um, like, could you be able 
folks like seeing their perspective as to like all the time they put into it that this could be a risk in supporting you? Yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see that. And I, I empathize with those people. Like, that your jo- especially living in New York, everything's so expensive. Your job is your job. And like, <coughs> we live in such a capitalistic society. I don't blame any of them for staying there and maybe not outwardly supporting me. Like, I, I totally get where they're coming from, and I totally understand why. Um, that being said, I do think that if enough of them came forward, I mean, there's plenty of evidence for all the other women that were involved. Like, they have good ground to stand on. Um, but I get why they didn't. Yeah. Would you have, were you in their shoes, do you think you would have had that um, power to step forward and be able to support this other person from the outside perspective? I've always been very stubborn. So if I think something should be a certain way, I usually will vocalize that. Um, Yeah, I don't know. If I was a dancer living in New York and was dependent on my money in that sense, I don't know. But go ahead. Um, what do you think was the difference between you wanting to speak out about it and going like the academia route versus other dancers who like similar situation as this has happened to, like still having to like deal with it and being glad about it? Like, why don't they also just kind of the transition or um, like why like what made you want to speak out about it and what do you think was the difference between like you versus like all the other people who were like survivors of um I wanted to speak out about it because I was the person that found all of it. Um, I tried to show every other woman involved everything and so many of them similar to how I had previously been seemed to be like very much in denial. Like, they didn't even want to see it. They haven't seen it. They want to act like it doesn't exist. Because I think in that way, it's almost like, oh, I'm not a victim of sexual assault. Like, I haven't seen it. It didn't happen to me. And it very much did. So I think that was like the big difference. Like, I couldn't look away. And they kind of had the choice to just believe whatever their boyfriends had said to them, which I know. I talked to some of them, they were like, well, he said he didn't say that. And I'm like, oh, I promise you, he said that. Like, it's right here. Um, so yeah, I think it was that I didn't have the option to run away. Building on that, I love your Instagram, by the way. Clean things. Clean Happy things. belated birthday. <laughs> um, like, I first saw your news breakout on YouTube and seeing your interview with Amanda Knox. And do you feel in that same way? You were just so sensationalized because I remember at that time seeing her in the news. I'm like, she must have done it. I was in a society that thought that way, you know? And then seeing you, I'm like, wait, let me see what else has to be said at that moment. I didn't make a decision, you know? But do you feel like from your perspective and your peers that they just immediately was like, no, you did something wrong. Chase didn't do anything. Um, actually, a majority of the people that reached out or commented were very supportive and were like, this is crazy, because in the lawsuit, um, they did, like, quote a lot of things, and I, I think it's like, maybe, I don't know, it might be like, against the law to say that something happened if it really didn't. So, I mean, it was (laughs) So, I feel like a lot of people were like, okay, like she's not making this up. But also like some people who were negative Mm -hmm. and blamed me said things that were like ridiculous. Like somebody, and they always were on YouTube. It was never on any other platform. Like the people with YouTube accounts (laughs) that have the time to sit there and comment. Um, But yeah, they would say ridiculous things like, um, you should have kept your legs crossed until marriage. Fun fact, there was a married couple involved in this, 
and the husband was taking photos of his wife without her knowing. So um, marriage didn't save anybody in that sense, and it wouldn't have saved me in that sense. And I mean, if that was coming from like somebody's religious belief, fine, have your own belief, but don't try to tell me that this was my fault because I didn't yeah. follow your religious belief, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, it was always really um, strange <laughs> things so, yeah. Yeah, that you could easily just pick apart, so it was mm -hmm. never extremely offensive. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of people actually did kind of believe me. And I mean, if people didn't, I'm kind of like, how could you not? Because it's always, in, in sexual assault things, it's always like a he said, she said. If somebody is raped, and it's hard to find evidence, and it's hard to like have documented proof that something happened to somebody. Um, in this case, sexual assault in the 21st century is very much like a technological thing. I've had people reach out saying that this happened to them on Snapchat, it happened to them you know, on Instagram DMs, whatever. Like, there's a lot of proof in this case. Like, uh, so when people are like, oh, I don't believe her, I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> like, I read through it daily, like I, it's all still on my phone. So, I don't know, I know it's. Thank you for being brave and coming out and doing all this yeah, because, yeah. For sure. Yeah. I think we have time for one last question. Um, the Me Too movement was pretty strong around two years ago, but some could say that it's like faded since then. Mm -hmm. What, if anything, do you think needs to be done to keep the conversation at the forefront of society? Um, I think the media doesn't really cover it. Like, so much time is spent around like Donald Trump and all of his stupid stuff, and it's kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> like there are actual things going on in the world, and people actually are experiencing things, and as a society, we need to have those conversations. So honestly, I think, the best way to go about that is doing stuff like the Berkeley Forum. Like, I think it's so amazing that you guys create this space. And um, I actually just joined this thing at Columbia that's like sexual respect ambassadors. And we hold like these little workshops on campus and we do surveys to collect data and statistics on campus assault or whatever. Um, I think when it comes down to it, it's really on us. Like, obviously, I've kind of also lost hope in the older generations. Um, it, it really is on us to continue the conversation and to continue to like educate yourselves. And um, like I was saying before, just appreciating people for being people and hearing out what people have to say. Well, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for answering our questions.